Welcome to uh, this online uh, service of worship of First Presbyterian Church here in Winchester. We're delighted that you have chosen to join us and once again, welcome. Following uh, this online service, we have a connect uh, with your neighbor opportunity and you can see that information on the screen. Uh, we do that via Zoom and you can find all the details on our um, Facebook page. Also, today is Father's Day. So uh, for all the men out there who have played a father role in someone's life, happy Father's Day. Friends, let us worship God. Loving God, you call us to turn away from our own selfish interests, to take up our cross and to follow you. To find our lives, may we live them in service of your mission. As we come before you this morning, give us open hearts and open hands. Make us eager to hear your voice and seek your guidance. Open our minds to your ever-present spirit that is always moving within and around us. Open our spirits to your nudging and open our lives to your love. Let's go. 
Friends, let us give our sin to God using the prayer of confession. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we call you Lord, yet it is too easy for us to worship other things, other activities, other relationships, other gods. You tell us we cannot serve two masters, yet we spend more time focusing our energies elsewhere, directing our time, our energy, our money, our attention away from you. Forgive us, gracious Savior, when our hearts are led astray, when we serve other gods and worship them. We pray this, counting on your grace. Amen. And friends, hear this pardon from God. Sisters and brothers, God is at work in us and with us. God is our clothing in which love enwraps, holds us, and all encloses us because of God's tender love, so that God may never leave us. We are protected safely in love, in woe as in well, by the goodness of God. God urges us, keep the word near you, even on your lips and in your heart. This word is our salvation. Amen. Mr. Todd here. So today I'd like to talk to you about something very important. I want to talk about not spreading germs. And I actually have what I think probably looks like a germ from my bag today. And so I thought it might be helpful if I shared all the different things that we can do to keep from spreading germs. Now, first, uh, what's that? Uh, you said that you already know about everything you need? to keep from spreading germs? Oh, okay. Um, well, then let me tell you about this guy. Oh, you said you don't need to hear about him? You're tired of hearing about germs? You want me to put him back in the bag? Oh, okay. Huh. And, and seal it up. All right. I've never done this before. All right, it's sealed. And staple it? Well, I did have a stapler. Okay. Huh. And you want me to do that? Really? and I will throw it away. Huh. Huh. What do we talk about now? We were gonna talk about not spreading germs. Huh. I don't even have my bag. I know. Let's talk about spreading something good. We've talked so much about not spreading germs that maybe today we can focus on spreading something that we want to spread, comfort. And so in today's Bible story, the Apostle Paul, who became an apostle after Jesus died and raised from the dead, he was sending a letter to the Corinthians, and in that letter, he said, share comfort. To comfort someone means to lessen the feelings of sadness that they have, or maybe the feelings of stress, or fear, or pain. God does this for us all the time. In today's scripture passage, it says that God is the God of all comfort. 
He's always coming alongside his children and helping lessen their stress and worry and pain. He does that for us so generously. And he wants us to do that for others. The scriptures say we should comfort others who are facing trouble. So I think it kind of works like this. God is the God of all comfort. And he comes alongside us and he comforts us. He lessens our feelings of sadness or fear or worry. And then, because God has done that for us, we are able to do that for someone else. So God is comforting them through us. And then that person has the opportunity to do that for someone else, to share comfort, to spread something good, spreading comfort to others. And it goes on and on and on. More and more are comforted by God and others as we recognize how God has comforted us, comforted us, and share it with others. It feels really good to be comforted. And so I wonder if you can imagine a time when maybe you needed some comfort. Maybe you were feeling sad or upset or frustrated and you needed someone to come alongside you. Hopefully you felt that from someone near to you. Hopefully you felt that from God. And because of that, you know how to do this. You know how to share and spread comfort. So maybe someone said kind words to you. Maybe they called you or spent time with you or made a card to, to help lessen those feelings of fear or sadness. Whatever they did is an idea that you can do for someone else. And so this is how we spread something good. And so that's your challenge this week. Um, everyone of all ages watching today, let's focus on spreading something good, comfort. Now join me in a word of prayer. Let's pray. God of all comfort, thank you for easing our feelings of sadness, stress, fear, and pain. Help us to be a comfort to others. Show us all how to spread something good. Amen.
2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11 from the Common English Bible. The greeting from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to God's church that is in Corinth, along with all of God's people throughout Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. God's comfort in trouble. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ be blessed. He is the compassionate Father and God of all comfort. He's the one who comforts us in all our trouble so that we can comfort other people who are in every kind of trouble. We offer the same comfort that we offer ourselves received from God. That is because we receive so much comfort through Christ in the same way that we share so many of Christ's sufferings. So if we have trouble, it is to bring you comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is to bring you comfort from the experience of endurance while you go through the same sufferings that we also suffer. Our hope for you is certain because we know that as you are partners in suffering, so also you are partners in comfort. Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be unaware of the troubles that we went through in Asia. We were weighed down with a load of suffering that was so far beyond our strength that we were afraid we might not survive. It certainly seemed to us as if we had gotten the death penalty. This was so that we would have confidence in God who raises the dead instead of ourselves. God rescued us from a terrible death and he will rescue us. We have set our hope on him that he will rescue us again since you are helping with your prayer for us. Then many people can thank God on our behalf for the gift that was given to us through the prayers of many people. Recall a time you needed to be consoled. You know, given the present moment, it shouldn't be all that difficult to do. Consolation is the comfort we receive, especially after a, a loss or a disappointment. You know, this pandemic, the economic downturn, the civil and social unrest over our society's inequities have resulted in one loss after another and disappointments too numerous to count. Worldwide, the number of infections is approaching 8 million, with the number of deaths approaching one half million. I'm fully aware that the global population is just over 7 billion people, and percentage-wise, the death toll is not that big. But the 8 million people who became infected by COVID-19 and the nearly half million who have died, each have a name and a family and friends who love them. And as important as numbers are, they only tell part of the story. The real story is who the person was and how he or she lived and what mattered to them. Where did they find joy? And where did they find sorrow? What made them laugh? What made them cry? So what does consolation look like in the face of this ongoing pandemic? What does consolation look like in the face of financial strain brought on by the pandemic? You know, what does consolation look like for black and brown brothers and sisters who are sick and tired of being sick and tired and want what every single person wants to be treated fairly with respect and dignity and not be discounted or dismean, demean rather, because of the color of their skin. Beginning today, 
over the course of the summer months, I am preaching five sermons on Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Paul sounds five themes in this letter. Consolation, forgiveness, treasure in clay jars, walking by faith and not by sight, and generosity. You know, I would encourage you over the next week to read 2 Corinthians through in one sitting. It's Paul's third longest letter, but it is still not that long. And then reread it, because Paul's prose can be challenging in places and requires more than one reading. You know, in nearly every one of Paul's other letters to the churches throughout the Mediterranean region, he begins with a word of thanks for those to whom he is writing. Not so with 2 Corinthians. Paul knows the Corinthian congregation. He has visited them twice before and hopes to visit them a third time because the previous visits had not gone as well as he had hoped. The Corinthian congregation had its issues. Evidently, some in that community could be prickly. And instead of thanksgiving, Paul begins with a blessing for the Corinthians by the God of all mercy and consolation. In five verses, Paul uses the word console. The common English Bible translates the word comfort because it's a word we are more likely to use and understand. He uses the word ten times. The consolation God provides, the comfort God provides, is for the purpose that we in turn would offer the same consolation the same comfort to others. And this is a central point in both Jewish and Christian theology. Remember, Paul was a devout Jew before he was a devout Christian. His Jewish faith taught him that God saved and liberated persons from whatever oppressed them so that they could be of service to others, so that we could be of service to others. You know, we are blessed to be a blessing. Service is the whole point of God's salvation. We are saved to serve. Paul sees this same theology at work in Christ. You know, our salvation and our being empowered to serve others is God's doing. The Corinthians worried as to whether they were up to the tasks of embodying Christ and carrying forth Christ's message. They feared they were too weak and lacked the necessary strength. Paul is writing in part to remind the Corinthians that God and Christ provides them with all the strength they need. You know, imagine conducting person-in-the-street interviews regarding religious matters, especially salvation. You know, I can recall being stopped by street corner evangelists and asked if I was saved but I can't recall anyone ever, at least out of sight of a Sunday school class or a Sunday sermon, asking me why I was saved. And those are two very different questions. Are you saved? Why are you saved? You know, evidently some in the Corinthian community may have lost sight of why they were saved. Paul doesn't question their relationship with God. He starts from a place where he knows 
that they already have one. They are saved, not of course as a result of anything they have said or done or as a result, but as a result of who God is. But Paul may have begun to wonder if the Corinthians had lost sight of why God saved them. Or for that matter, why God saves anyone. You know, I want to tell you a story. I was born in the 1950s. I came of age in the 1960s. And I entered adulthood in the 1970s. The world then as now was changing rapidly. There was the civil rights movement, the assassinations of John Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., Bobby Kennedy, the integration of schools, cities were literally burning. There was the Vietnam War. An American president resigned in disgrace. Economically, our nation was experiencing high unemployment and double-digit inflation. I could add to the list, but I'm going to stop there. And you know what my church had to say about these as well as other matters that were emblazoned in bold each morning above the fold in the newspaper. You know what my church had to say about segregation, about racial inequality, war, corruption and politics, very little, as I recall. Almost nothing, really. Crickets. It was a peculiar kind of silence. It was odd religious leadership. The Jesus preached from the pulpit of my formative years was mostly a personal Jesus. Salvation was personal too. I was saved. Jesus saved me. And the reason, so I could go to heaven. That was why I was saved. I needn't concern myself with other matters. They were somehow outside of religious concern. It was a while before I realized that Jesus is more than my Jesus, that He is the world's Jesus. It was a while before I realized that salvation wasn't just for me and my little world, that salvation was big really big. It was social and it encompassed a world that I couldn't even begin to imagine. A world full of people. And Jesus had a whole lot more in mind than just getting me to heaven and getting everyone else to heaven. Jesus saved me and everyone else. Yes, the world, so that we would be free to serve others because we were so bound to the service of ourselves and our own interests, which resulted in injustice. It took me a while to learn that serving others meant standing beside them. That's what Christians do, that serving others meant speaking up for them, especially if their voices weren't being heard. That's what Christians do. That serving others meant sharing with them what we have, especially if we have enough and they don't. That's what Christians do. That serving others meant not saying a thing and simply listening, especially when they know more about what they are talking about and we don't. That's what Christians do. That's why God saved me. That's why God saved you. That's why God saved the world. And on our own, we're not up to it. 
We are weak, but with God in Christ, we are up to it. God strengthens us. This is what thy kingdom come and the Lord's prayer is all about on earth as it is in heaven. This is what Paul is reminding the Corinthians of here in the opening of this letter. God didn't save them because God liked them best or that they had garnered God's attention in some way. God saved them to continue the work of Christ, the work of service in Christ's name. You know, in college, I was a history major. And history majors are trained to take the measure of a moment. What makes this moment historic? Why is it important? We're trained to ask, what is the moment? How did we get here? And why did we end up at this moment rather than another? America is having a moment right now. I believe. The Christian church is having a moment right now. I believe. The challenge, of course, is to properly identify it. And that's hard. I'm reminded of Soren Kierkegaard's observation that life only makes sense looking backward. It's a shame we have to live it looking forward. In any given moment, we can't know what history's verdict will be. And yet, we still have to live in and through the moment nonetheless, as faithfully as we can, trusting Christ each and every step along the way. I believe that we are at a moment where justice has come to matter more than it ever has, at least in my lifetime. I believe we are at a moment where inequity is no longer tolerable. In fact, it is unbearable. Things that we didn't see or chose not to see, like racism, are fast becoming unacceptable, thoroughly unacceptable. It, all, it is also an uneasy moment because on our way to living more faithfully in God's reign or to use civic language on our way to a more perfect union, the road can be rocky and circuitous. History seldom moves across smooth terrain and in a straight line. My experience is the same goes for the journey of faith. It's often bumpy with many a sharp turn along the way. And in this moment, I want Christians to remember what the church said and how the church behaved. I want Christians to remember that the church lived into and from its salvation and served others in the name of Christ. Standing with those who needed standing with. Speaking for those who couldn't speak for themselves. Denouncing ugly ideas about race that holds white skin color as superior and black and brown skin color inferior. Or uglier yet, ideas about race that holds white skin color as the skin color by which all others are measured and judged. Which is one of racism's most insidious manifestations. It's tempting for the church to turn inward when the world becomes scary. I get that. There are chapters in our history where this is exactly what we have done. The church in uh, its history, and especially in this country, was late to the game when it came to saying and then doing something about the treatment of Native Americans. 
slavery, women's suffrage, child labor, Jim Crow, segregation. Let's learn from these painful chapters and get better and do better with God's help. Christ calls us to turn outward every time. The pandemic has disrupted so much of life and livelihoods, but it has taken us beyond the walls of our buildings and campus, which is a complicated blessing. I miss being with you in person, but my heart is warm to see the ways in which we are becoming more intentionally the body of Christ in this community. Jesus calls us to look, to see, to act. Our consolation in Christ, our comfort in Christ, our salvation in Christ unites us not only to Christ, but to all of humanity as well. When brothers and sisters rejoice, we rejoice with them. And when they sorrow, we sorrow with them. We who have experienced and know God's salvation in Christ become partners with God in fostering the same salvation for fellow brothers and sisters. It will not be easy work. It will cost us. Paul's work was not easy work. It cost him. But it is the work of God whose Spirit enables us. Next week, we will be reading chapter 2 and exploring what Paul has to say to us about forgiveness. Amen. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we come to you now more afraid than we would like to admit. The fear of contagion surrounds us. The fear of economic hardship abounds. The fear that justice and reconciliation are impossible creeps into our consciousness even when we want to be a people of hope. As we continue to navigate the unfamiliar waters of a pandemic and the all too familiar storms of long entrenched inequity, we admit we are afraid. We name our deepest anxieties before you, knowing that you know them before we speak them. You tell us that even the hairs on our heads are counted and therefore we pour out our hearts before you trusting not only that you will hear our cries, but that you will answer them. Hear our cries on behalf of the oppressed and the exploited. Let justice roll down like water and righteousness, like an ever-flowing stream. Hear our cries of lament on behalf of those whose losses are too many to name and too heavy to continue to carry. Give them your easy yoke and your light burden. Hear our cries of grief as we join our siblings who mourn. Comfort them until they see you face to face and crying and death are no more. Hear our cries for the sick and suffering, the lonely and the shunned. Heal them, restore them, help us to seek them out and bring them home in your name. Hear our cries for those we love, those we are called to love, and those we find difficult to love. Grant us your spirit of strength and wisdom so that we can live the commandment we know, the greatest commandment, to love you with all we have and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Gracious God, you come to us now assuring us of your presence with us and your power working through us in confidence that that perfect love casts out fear. We commit to seeking to live with unafraid faith, 
proclaiming boldly the good news of Christ Jesus that will set us all free. We make our prayer in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. There are many ways to respond to God's goodness and grace. And one of those ways is being generous. Generous with our time, generous with our talent, generous with our money when we give through the church. It is our generosity that sustains the witness and the mission of this congregation in this community and beyond. Let us receive the offering. Receive this benediction. So now we leave this time and this space of worship. 
And while so much of the road ahead remains uncertain, the path constantly changing, we know some things that are as solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know God is love. We know Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit is there, found in the space between all things, closer to us than our next breath, binding us together until we meet again. Go in peace. Amen.